active narratives, or how video games have revolutionized storytelling. Has the most radical change ever in storytelling occurred without anyone noticing? Maybe not, but I do think that something radical is being slightly overlooked. Hello, I'm Huey, and this is the channel Delta, your underqualified guide in his vehicle on this incredible journey into understanding the oft-ignored beauty of narrative construction in video games. The red-headed stepchild of the narrative arts, video games are frequently viewed as lacking in exceptional storytelling. I, as a hashtag gamer myself, would have to disagree with this consensus. Games approach storytelling in a radically new method, which I will pretentiously call creating an active narrative. To understand why this approach is unique, however, we need to know about how all the other narrative arts have shared their stories. Part 1. The way it used to be. In order to see how things have been before, we must define the other narrative arts. Plays, novels, films, television, and music are the most common ones, though I am confident the brilliant minds of the YouTube comment section will doubtless remind me of others. Each one is, at its core, a method of communicating a fictional series of events which follows some progression for the characters within it. Now, some of these art forms do occasionally delve into nonfiction arenas, but as we will see later, video games may be incapable of this. We will try to focus on the fictional versions of these arts. So, we can redefine storytelling as the communication of fictional or fictionalized events surrounding some central character or characters through some means. The narrative arts I listed earlier largely follow this definition in a surprisingly similar manner, each telling its own stories. Now think of your favorite movie, show, book, etc. How would you describe that movies, shows, or books manner of relating slash telling their story to you? How much control do you have over the story's progression? Stew on these questions as we explore how the older narrative arts share their stories and their method. Since the beginning of human history, we have been telling stories through older oral traditions and continuing into books, plays, shows, films, and throughout them all, there was a clear delineation between producer and consumer. In a novel, the author is the producer and the reader is the consumer. For shows, movies, and plays, the cast and crew are the producers and the audience member is the consumer. Aside from the rare choose-your-own-adventure novel, dinner theater performance, or Black Mirror episode, all of these methods feature stories presented as finished products to the consumer, meaning the work is complete without the consumer actually needing to consume it. Books, movies, songs, plays, and shows all come from their producers finalized with the consumer not participating in the storytelling process. This is what I am going to call passive or one-sided storytelling, where the story occurs in its entirety without it actually needing to be consumed. Whether or not you read the novel or watch the film, the story is finished and unchanging. Now I know that some viewers will be raising two complaints at this point, but Huey, what about sequels? And a play doesn't happen without an audience. And both are valid comments. Luckily, since I have written a script for this video in advance, I already have a brilliant answer prepared for your questions. Sequels are still unique stories and can stand alone, just as the story that came before them stands alone. They may not be as good without the context of the previous story, but sequels still deal with unique events. Even if a sequel seems to rely completely on previous fictional events from that first story, it is important to realize that all stories depend on some form of previous event, even the first novel in the saga. A Game of Thrones, the first book in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire saga, is built on a fictional world full of events in history. It just doesn't draw those events from another novel. Its sequel, A Crown of Kings, draws on A Game of Thrones' events in the same way A Game of Thrones draws on the lore of the world. So sequels do not alter the idea of works as complete before reaching the consumer. And even if you still disagree, it is worth remembering that we have defined passive storytelling as not involving the consumer in the storytelling process, and a sequel does not overtly do this more than a base novel. The idea of a play needing an audience is a more advanced idea that a book needs a reader, incorporating the live nature of performance. Most of us can recognize that whether or not anyone reads a book, the story on the pages still exists. A play seems different, however, because it is performed directly before the audience, and one would assume the performance would not occur if no one showed up. However, is each full rehearsal of the show not the story being told without an audience? Does the audience vastly alter the progression of the events in Hamlet? Is the script not a story in itself? 
Sure, an actor may misalign because they are stressed by the audience, but the presence of the audience is not about to change the plot and keep Hamlet alive at the end. So, while it is unlikely that the play is going to be performed to an empty house, a play is still a packaged product delivered to the audience in a one-sided method, just like all the other narrative arts I've described. In short, the vast majority of traditional narrative arts are passive. Now that I've spent a few minutes ranting about how books, movies, shows, plays, music, etc. are all just passively communicating their stories to the audience, I want to make it very clear that I don't dislike this kind of storytelling. I'm currently an undergraduate majoring in English literature, which for those who are not pursuing the same degree means that I read books for a living right now. I love literature enough to devote my life to it, and I am obsessed with understanding the storytelling process. I do not believe that one narrative art uses a superior method, and we will discuss why in a later section. However, this background does make my approach to understanding storytelling more literarily critical, analyzing all components, accepting how one personally responds emotionally. I am used to examining how people academically respond from the ivory tower and the actual details of the storytelling itself, but my approach tends to overlook how people feel about how they are told a story. So I want to say now that if you disagree with my conclusions on emotional lines rather than critical, realize your feelings are actually more important. Stories are mostly for enjoyment, and if you enjoy a passive method and hate active methods, that is totally fine. This is more of critical examination of potential capabilities, not an analysis of subjective emotional responses. With that little disclaimer and personal background out of the way, we'll tackle one last component of passive storytelling, adjacent interaction. Before video games brought active storytelling to the mainstream, which we will explain in a moment, we still looked for a way to engage with the stories we love. We cannot actively change the established plot of those stories, so we pursue what I'm going to call adjacent interaction. Fan fiction, cosplay, etc. are examples of this phenomenon where we insert ourselves into, pretend to participate as characters from, or alter meaningfully the stories we enjoy. Since we are not producers in the canonical storytelling process and passive methods, our desire to engage is channeled into creating offshoot stories or pretending to be in said story. Adjacent interaction is wonderful and delightfully fun, but passive storytelling itself limits us from complete entrance. It is told to us as one plot, and as hard as we try, we can only ever create non-canonical interactions with the text. The swarms of adjacent interaction all highlight the limitation of one-sided storytelling. To engage with stories fully in these methods, consumers must become producers, and consumers can rarely become producers of the works they already love. Even if you love a play and get to act in a production of that play, it will not be the version of the play that made you fall in love. So, again in conclusion, Consumers must become producers of the work they love to fully engage, but overwhelmingly cannot do so in passive storytelling, resulting in adjacent interaction. None of this is outright bad, but active storytelling promises a deeper intimacy while still allowing adjacent interaction where desired. Part 2. The Changing Nature of Choice So how are games revolutionary? If every previous narrative art has required one to switch to the producer role to move beyond passive participants and simultaneously made this switch impossible, why would we assume video games would be any different? The secret is surprisingly simple. Games introduce choice throughout the narrative. Choice is important because it contains and creates two aspects not found in passive storytelling methods, necessity and uniqueness. Think about Pac-Man a game no one would be rushing to call story-rich. You could honestly debate if Pac-Man even has a story, but it is an excellent case study in the relevance of choice. Imagine that you walk up to an old Pac-Man arcade cabinet and put in a quarter to start the game. Were Pac-Man a passive experience, the game would begin to run through a specific course and end in the same place. As I have very obviously set up, however, this does not occur. Rather, you have to control Pac-Man. You decide what turns he makes, and in what order he eats those weird little round things. What are those supposed to be? Hold up, like, what are those things? Okay, it's a tangent, I'll recenter, but seriously, someone please let me know what they are. You also decide, through how well you play, when Pac-Man dies to the ghosts. In these ways, Pac-Man shows both necessity and uniqueness. For the quote-unquote story of Pac-Man to progress, it necessitates a player be controlling Pac-Man. 
and since the player will not necessarily always take the same path, each player's journey through a game of Pac-Man is unique. While Pac-Man is an incredibly simplistic example, we can use it to define the two components that differentiate games from other forms of storytelling. One, the story requires a player's interaction. Since every choice is already programmed into a game, the story can only escape its Schrodinger's cat-esque state of having every possible outcome present by having a player make decisions that eliminate some options. By contrast, Game of Thrones spoilers here, so skip ahead if you don't want to hear them, Ned Stark will always be executed in the same place and in the same method in the story, no matter what I as a reader or viewer choose to do. In essence, I am not necessary for the story of Game of Thrones in the way that I would be in a game, even one as simple as Pac-Man. The second component is uniqueness. For the choices to have any significance, another player must have been able to make a slightly different choice. We will address the magnitude of choice and what makes a choice noteworthy in a later section, but for now, a choice as insignificant as whether I go right or left in Pac-Man is a unique choice. So, looking at our previous definition of passive storytelling, we see that it no longer applies to games. Since a player is both necessary and creates a unique experience through being given choice, they redefine the consumer role. Before, producers sent a completed story to the consumer, who at best could take it in and make an adjacent work. But now the consumer is the player, and the role of player is an advancement. The player is perhaps better called the initiator or instigator, since they hold a causal power in active storytelling. So, in summary, games are a narrative art that shifts from passive to active storytelling because they introduce choice as necessity for progress, transforming consumer into initiator and partner. Active narratives are defined not by the consumer's reception, but rather by the player's engagement with the story which is necessary and unique for each consumer. In essence, the story can only conclude with specificity with the player's engagement, so they become a consumer-producer hybrid. But this leads us to another question. Is this really better? Part 3. Advancement versus Improvement Now, fans of games likely answered that last question with a resounding yes, and our bookworm friends shouted no. However, I have bamboozled you all, since that question is inherently flawed. Better is subjective, so we could do better to separate that question into two questions. Is the change from passive to active an advancement, and is that change an improvement? Advancement is simply upgrading or modernizing the method behind something, whereas improvement is a qualitative shift. Let's think about Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and the Fellowship of the Ring. The book, that is. Now, at first, we might assume that COD fails as an active narrative, but it shockingly does give us choices, though they may not be obvious or meaningful. As any one of us plays through the first level of advanced warfare, we will shoot our opponents in a different order, move in a different way, and use different weapons. So, while we are all playing the same level, we most likely make different choices in how to progress through that level. Our definition of active narrative requires unique choices to be made, and even these choices satisfy that baseline. By contrast, the plot and events of Fellowship of the Ring will never change based on the choices I make, so we can conclude that advanced warfare is an advancement in storytelling technique, being an active narrative where Fellowship is passive. Now, I don't know about you all, but I am fairly willing to argue that no one thinks the game that had such heart-rending emotional moments as press F to pay respects is a better story than one of the greatest fantasy novels of all time. If you really do think Advanced Warfare is better than Fellowship, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you'll come back later after a lot of self-reflection and finish the video. Jokes aside, the point is that just because Call of Duty Advanced Warfare is an advancement in storytelling, it is in no way an improvement over Lord of the Rings. A more advanced storytelling style does not necessarily make a story any better. Another example of this idea can be shown within music. Let's compare acoustic and electric guitars. The electric guitar was an advancement over the acoustic guitar. That is doubtless. But the music created with an electric guitar is not necessarily always an improvement over music created with an acoustic guitar. There are amazing songs made with electric guitars, acoustic guitars, both, and neither. 
And similarly, there are terrible songs made with electric guitars, acoustic guitars, both, and neither. I hope that you understand the central idea behind the differentiation between passive and active storytelling. Active storytelling is an advancement over passive storytelling, but that does not necessarily make it an improvement. So, what makes this an improvement? When does active storytelling actually provide additional value, rather than just letting us shoot bad guys in a different order? This brings us naturally to the idea of story-relevant choice. If you are one of the viewers who went directly to the description to read the section headings, one, why? And two, you already noticed that part six is called plot irrelevance. That section deals with how games redefine the expectations surrounding plot, whereas this is more a fundamental section about good versus bad choices in active storytelling. When I say good and bad choice, I am not referring to the morality of the choice, but rather whether the choice is meaningful to the progression of the story. To understand this duality, let's examine Fallout 4 and Fallout New Vegas. We've already seen an example of largely pointless choices for storytelling purposes, in what order you kill generic enemies in Call of Duty, and we need to explain why that is so pointless. The order of their deaths does not dramatically alter the characterization of the player or of the world as a whole, so we can safely say that the choice is a low-quality or low-impact choice. Now let's compare that to Fallout perk trees, which are more meaningful. While the decision to take a perk like Black Widow or Lady Killer in Fallout New Vegas is clearly a choice that opens new dialogue and has story impact, specking into different fighting styles in Fallout 4 still has more gravitas than the target order choice in Call of Duty. In the fight against Kellogg, the choice to be a stealth sniper radically alters the whole encounter, since you may want to shoot him before you even enter dialogue, since you get your critical bonus from being hidden in the hallway. If I am instead a melee fighter, I am forced to walk forward and engage with this conversation. This choice limits what information I can get out of the scene and changes how much story my character and I as a player know. However, I still kill Kellogg either way, so while this is a slightly more meaningful choice than before, it is still not incredibly world-altering. Compared to the COD choice, however, the Fallout 4 combat style and perk choices have a world of impact. For truly meaningful choices, however, I'm going to compare the endings from Fallout 4 and Fallout New Vegas, so spoilers if you care. Now that you've been warned, we actually need to spoil both games, and these games will come up a lot throughout this video, so pay attention. Fallout 4 eventually has you side with one of the four factions, the Minutemen, the Railroad, the Brotherhood of Steel, and the Institute, in the quest to find your son. The end of the story with any faction sees you destroy two others, and in the post-story gameplay you no longer have access to those factions. Choosing a faction is an incredibly impactful choice in Fallout 4, but let's juxtapose this with Fallout New Vegas. Unlike Fallout 4, New Vegas ends the game after the final mission, and since it does not continue to allow the player to play, it is free to make the choice of faction, here the New California Republic, the Legion, Mr. House, or Yes Man, far more impactful. In Fallout 4, the only major change is the absence of the two factions you destroy. It's always two, and once you destroy them, your player loses access to the faction's bases, their Radiance quest, and maybe has some small skirmishes with faction survivors. As far as the player and the player character know, the world does not change massively in the future. This choice is hugely important to the immediate story arc, but it may not feel as meaningfully different as the endings to fall at New Vegas. In New Vegas, the game ends by telling the player through cutscenes how all of their decisions along the way shape the Mojave Wasteland as a whole, as well as the lives of their companions. There are some objectively awful outcomes. Slavery with the Legion, the fall of society under Yes Man and the player, etc. And the player's decisions don't just alter the immediate places they can go, but dramatically redefine the entire world they've been playing in for the last few dozen hours. See. Both of these choices are massively relevant to the plot of the game, but New Vegas does a much better job defining the exact impact for the player, and highlights how even small decisions, like the additional factions that could support the player's side, mattered. While Fallout 4 faction decision has story relevance, it is not nearly as meaningful as New Vegas is, though interestingly, some cut content from Fallout 4 actually showcases a really interesting twist on faction selection, and how the choice could have been more nuanced. If you sided with the Brotherhood in the final release of the game, you would destroy the Institute and the Railroad, since they oppose the Brotherhood's views on technology, specifically on synths, the robot humanoids that in some ways drive the game's plot. 
However, there was a plot idea where you could have killed the Brotherhood's leader, Elder Maxon, and assumed his role. And if you did, you received the option to save the Railroad, since they do an objective net good. This change is relatively major, since there now would be a way to actually change the makeup of the Commonwealth relative to other endings. I hope that this discussion of the different kinds of choices in Fallout 4 and New Vegas highlight what we are ideally looking for in active storytelling. A central concern is providing the player a choice that has a discernible and consequential impact in telling the story. Not all choices in a game must meet this bar, but having some is necessary for the game to fully benefit from the advancements of active storytelling. This is not to say that some railroad-style games don't have amazing stories, just that games that want to use player choice as a vehicle for storytelling must make the choices notably meaningful. But now I have to badly segue into how games build their worlds indirectly. So, part four, world building as storytelling. Games, as active storytelling, have the luxury of not ever sharing every detail with the player directly. And this is where we get the video game idea of world building. World building exists in every medium, but we can recontextualize the term in gaming to focus on how active games create lore and backstory through the elements that are present in the larger world. Perhaps the most notable example of this is the item descriptions in Dark Souls games, of which we will look at Dark Souls 3. Much of, if not all, the information about the game's world, backstory, and lore is contained in the flavor text on the bottom of the item page. If you want to understand more about the relationships between, say, the bosses Pontiff Sulavan and the Dancer of the Boreal Forest, you would need to read the item descriptions for the Dancer's Twin Blades, the Pontiff Eye Rings, etc. The game's direct story is about unkindled ash slaying the Lords of Cinder, returning them to their thrones, and then linking the fire, letting the fire fade, or usurping the fire. To understand the details of the cycle of fire, the world, the interaction of the bosses, etc., you really need to read those item descriptions. Any game that does lore and world building through this kind of method actually gives the player another choice. In essence, Dark Souls only reveals as much lore to the player as items the player chooses to pick up and read. The beauty of loading lore into a story in this fashion is that it allows the player to dictate their own engagement level. If a passive story wants to build in elements of world building, they either have to include all of it and potentially bog down the main narrative, or publish an entirely separate text, which poses its own problems. Since games world build through these indirect methods that allow players to embrace the world beyond the central narrative to their own extent, they are inherently the best and most seamless method of expanding surrounding lore. They may have the best method, but that doesn't mean they always succeed at this, however. Some people find Dark Souls' item description lore spreading style frustrating, and just want an effective summary of the game's larger story. This demand is so great that whole YouTube channels have grown communities around sharing the lore. I have to admit, I personally engage with Dark Souls lore through Vati Vidya's channel, who is actually one of the YouTubers who drew me to start my own channel, since I enjoyed their content so much. In case you have not seen their work but still somehow found me, I will link the channel in the description. Now some of you might rightly be asking if this method of lore through item flavor texts, which I have previously held up as world altering, is actually that good if people have to turn to YouTube to understand it. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. For some, the effort to form a full picture from those descriptions is the definition of tedium, but for others it becomes the game's whole purpose. I think where active world building is made or broken is in the mechanisms used. Dark Souls' method may not be for everyone, but it certainly gets engagement, and it is actively supplemented by the level geometry and design. A game succeeds when the method it uses blends well with the setting it presents. Games, or any active story, must place the consumer in some sort of world, and the visual or structural elements of that world must match with the lore the game tries to share. Fallout provides lore through optional dialogue trees, Bloodborne does throw through items and closed doors, and Pathologic shares it through text crawls and theater shows. All of these complement their world. Fallout is an open world that feels alive, so it makes sense that people in that world will be willing to tell you about it. This, plus notes and terminals, comprise the majority of Fallout's lore, and at least in the earlier games, felt like natural parts of the world that you as a player discover. Bloodborne is telling a horror story, one where the town is monstrous and the short snippets you get from people in houses add to the terror that the bars in those windows establish. 
Pathologic is trying to trick you and plays around with ideas of deception. And so theatrical performances and written monologues read to the player mix with the game's sensations of falseness. Each game presents its semi-optional information in a different way. And since each method is supplemented by or itself supplements the structure of the world, it functions. If a player skips it, they are not necessarily hurt, but if they engage, they gain. This is the difference that active storytelling creates with background. If passive stories have background, processing it can drag on the narrative, or not reading its supplemental text may make following the main text hard. Many of us have read a book where the expositional context bogs down the narrative without directly advancing the plot. Since a game must function and be playable without the lore details, those details become only a net positive, as long as those background elements remain non-essential. So, we have a decent understanding of how active storytelling can expand world building and lore implementation in ways that passive storytelling never could. But how does gameplay itself shape that current story? Part 5. Gameplay as Storytelling Excellent YouTuber and my main inspiration for making my own channel, HBomberGuy, has explained an idea called play conditioning in his videos on Fallout 3, Dark Souls 2, and Bloodborne. If you somehow have not seen these videos, HBomb's channel will be linked in the description, so please go watch all of them. They are excellent. Play conditioning, as HBomb explains, is the idea that the game teaches you how to play through its mechanics, choosing for you in some ways. For example, as HBomb says in the Bloodborne video, the game intentionally takes away the shield from previous Soulsborne games and provides the rally system, where players regain health after getting hit if they do damage. Compared to previous games within the Soulsborne franchise, Bloodborne's mechanical choices and gameplay systems encourage players to be far more aggressive. In essence, the gameplay mechanics condition players to approach the game in a certain way. This idea of play conditioning is a good explanation for how players learn to interact with and behave within a game, and I want to show how there is a similar process that occurs with our understanding of the game's story, more specifically of the characters we play. The way games let us play indirectly describe the characters we play as, and we could call this the indirect characterization component of active storytelling. I'm so incredibly creative. The story changes to some extent around the choices a player makes, and the gameplay and mechanisms shape those choices, as well as steering them into the subsequent characterization. This can be accomplished through the difficulty of the challenge, the way the player tackles the challenges, the distributions of items, etc. Let's return to the Soulsborne franchise for a second. Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne each tackle healing along different lines. In Dark Souls 3, players are provided with the Estus Flask a refillable upon death item that provides a reliable source of healing. It can be upgraded both to heal more hit points and to hold more doses. By contrast, Bloodborne allows the player to hold 20 blood vials that restore a percentage of their maximum health. The player does not get 20 more when they die and respawn, rather collecting them from enemies in the world, storing and drawing from the excess over 20. So, if you consistently die to the same boss, you can run out of blood vials, something that happens often to new players at the start of the game. This is indirect storytelling and characterization that lets the player know different things about themselves and their worlds. In Dark Souls, the Estus Flask makes the player feel stronger and more powerful as the game goes on, like a hero. By the end, even though the bosses are mightier, you feel hardier too. Estus acts like a water bottle of healing, a reliable companion that grows as the player does. By comparison, blood vials are sinister and unreliable. There is a certain need to succeed quickly, since repeated attempts at the same boss risk depleting the player of the resource that gives them a chance. The player feels weak and insignificant, and the nature of the blood vials feels impersonal. Whereas the Estus flask belonged to the player, blood vials drop from enemies and only ever heal a percent. You are just another hunter in a world of beasts, hunters, crows, and monsters, using the same sinister resources as everyone else. The blood vial system makes the player smaller, and the Estus Flask does the opposite. These gameplay mechanics reveal one trait about the player character, but we can find some clearer and larger examples, which surprisingly brings us to Ubisoft. Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands and Tom Clancy's The Division are, seemingly, similar games. 
and yes, I'm talking about the originals, not Breakpoint or The Division 2. Wildlands and D1 are better, don't at me. The games both deal with teams of one to four characters, three NPC companions if you are in Wildlands single player, who are elite covert soldiers fighting with modern weapons in real open world locations. The overall plots are rather unique, with Wildlands seeing the ghosts dismantle the Santa Blanca cartel in Bolivia, and the Division seeing sleeper agents attempt to restabilize New York City after a bioweapon attack on Black Friday. The games have players fight in very different ways, however. Ghost Recon makes players feel like strong silent killers on the hardest difficulty, called Tier 1 mode, which is rather easy if people plan out attacks and use stealth to take shots, since enemies are statistically on par with players. However, the game is nigh impossible if you go loud, with waves and waves of enemies who can deal as much damage to the players as the players can dish out themselves. Tactics are essential to effective play, since the weapon damage and health of players and enemies is roughly on par, and so the mechanics and balance make players feel like human elites, transforming them into the ghosts the game describes them as. Additionally, the game will occasionally remove choice from the player to help maintain the image it creates through its mechanics. Several missions do not allow the ghost to kill the cartel boss they have been chasing, holding them to a moral standard that might be inconvenient. This idea even holds up in the game's endings, spoilers ahead now, where the players either take down El Sueño, the leader, after dismantling half or all of Santa Blanca. If they dismantle only half the cartel, they get the bad ending, where their government handler, breaking down as they realize they may not be able to hold El Sueño accountable, kills him effectively guaranteeing there will be no justice. If the players made the painstaking choice to dismantle the entire cartel, however, they're able to arrest El Sueño and achieve the good ending. The ending dichotomy for Wildlands strikes the same chords the gameplay reveals about the characters. It may be slower to plan out the stealthy approach, but you are quiet professionals, and doing your due diligence, be it scouting with a drone over an airstrip or taking down the entire cartel, is the better choice. Wildland uses its combat, which is effectively the entire game, to underscore the image it wants its players to have of who they are within the narrative. The idea of who is not about a specific person necessarily, this isn't about Nomad having an elaborate character arc, but what the characters archetypally bring to the story. The Division, on the other hand, is incredibly brutal by the endgame. Enemies take dozens, even hundreds of bullets to kill, and can drop you in just a few. The combat spaces are often enclosed, your tools take time to recharge, and the game is singularly unforgiving. Similarly, the game ends in suspense, setting up a sequel or continuation of some sort. Whereas Wildlands made you feel like an elite human fighting against grunt humans, The Division makes you feel like the average person slash hidden agent you are, who left their normal life to fight against overwhelming force and maybe carve out a little normalcy for New York. The world has become complete chaos, and the division makes you feel small in front of that chaos. Now some in the audience may rightfully point out that these games are not known for their exceptional storylines, and it may seem like I am trying to make something out of nothing. I pick these Tom Clancy games, however, because I believe their general lack of complexity makes the idea of gameplay characterization easier to understand. Games with more complex stories will more subtly use gameplay to characterize, so we need to find a glaring example to show this. But this raises a question. If I liked these games with middling plots enough to use them for this video, does plot even matter to active storytelling? Part 6. Plot Irrelevance How many fictional books have you read where you weren't reading for the plot? Probably none, if we're being honest. How about how many movies? Maybe a few films just for the action of them, but most at least sort of center around a story. Now some of you may be thinking back to grade school where you simply read because you had to, but that's not what we mean here. These narrative arts are just that, narrative-centric. But are there stories that we can enjoy without actually caring about the story? See, baked into this video up to this point has been the assumption that the narrative arts, from books to games, from passive to active, all must tell a story well to be good. But is this true? Well. Poetry would say no. See, poems are a passive narrative art, but the vast majority tend to never directly share their story. Excluding certain subgenres like the epic poem, the primary function of the narrative and language of a poem is to produce an emotion in the reader, rather than draw them in and connect them with a plot. 
games can be similar to poetry. I mentioned Call of Duty Advanced Warfare earlier, and while the game has a notoriously bad plot, drop an F in the comments to pay respects to this game's plot, I still enjoy it. My friends and I will still gather around a lot of COD games, even just to play zombies. See, these games may not be masterpieces, but they still succeed in spite of poor storylines since they can bring joy. This idea is why many people overlook games in serious critique. They're meant to be fun, not to inspire or provoke thought or whatever other rubbish we require for something to deserve critical recognition. Games generally have an established trope tied to them. We view them along certain lines, and this misses the point sometimes, since it either excludes noteworthy depth or excludes the intrinsic joy. We'll talk about upsetting these tropes in a second, but first, we have to address how games shift the central plot arc of narratives. In most games, the player is the hero. When I say hero, the nerds I mean the scholars in the audience will doubtless think of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. For those unfamiliar, it's the idea that stories follow a kind of universal myth or structure around their central character. Campbell's theory is flawed, but moreover, it can never truly account for an actively told narrative. See, once you make the consumer, aka the player, the story's protagonist, their emotions redefine the narrative. Even if the player is railroaded through the hero's journey, they still may not emotionally connect with every element, and since they are the protagonist, one has got to ask if the character can follow the journey if the player does not. Some games say yes, others say no, but many games replace the hero's journey with a new and different arc, the world's journey. The world's journey does not necessarily need the player character to evolve in specific ways, Rather, they just need to have an increasing effect on the world of the game. As the effect they have grows, the world begins to change as a result of their actions, fundamentally linking player growth with world shift. Unlike the hero's journey, the world's journey does not need to reach a specific destination. If it did, any story that failed to reach this ending wouldn't fit, which would mean that players could only really ever end a game along one string of choices, effectively reducing that game to passive storytelling. To see a few good examples of games built around the world's journey, we can return to Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 4. In Fallout New Vegas, you begin as a male courier shot over a package, and in Fallout 4, you start as a pre-war parent cryogenically frozen for 200 years on a quest to rescue their son. Both characters begin as largely irrelevant in the larger world, and as they carry out their personal quests, they experience the world around them and make connections. These connections and their personal quests lead them to cross paths with their game's major factions, and from there become members of one of those factions. Once in a faction, the player rises in power. In Fallout New Vegas, the factions are pitted against each other early, so as you do more tasks for the faction, the other factions begin to push back with greater and greater force. The world becomes increasingly less stable as you cause chaos, and eventually you and your faction bring war to Hoover Dam and take control of the game world. In Fallout 4, certain factions and plotlines fully exclude others, and by the end of the game, you may have destroyed large swaths of the Commonwealth. At first, it is easy to look at both of these games' plots as relating heavily to the player or relating heavily to the world, but if we pay close attention, we can see that the best explanation is the player-driven world journey. Without the player character, none of the events unfold, but the most important events that do unfold are world scale, not player scale. Games have the luxury to make the player semi-stationary and the world semi-mobile, which is much harder to accomplish in passive storytelling. A character that doesn't develop in a book is most likely shoddy writing, but a player who plays their character the same will still get to experience a story with change, the external change to the world. We could expand many of the games we've discussed today into this arc. As Wildlands plays out, more and more of the resistance fighters appear and fewer areas are cartel controlled. Bloodborne slowly reveals its hidden monstrosities like the amygdalas, and Dark Souls 3 eventually places the dark sign in the sky. In each, the player as a character may be the same, meaning who they are as a person, not who they are stats-wise, but the world is changing with their progression beyond what is simply necessary to advance the physical game. This is how the world's journey is replacing the hero's journey, and this replacement is the main example of how games are upsetting general narrative tropes, but they also often flummox their own conventions. We think of games as fun, fair, and forgiving, 
But are they? Are they always? And do they have to be? Each one of those three ideas has actually been proven wrong by a game in this video. Dark Souls and Bloodborne are not forgiving. Anyone who has played a Soulsborne game can tell you how little margin for error there is, or at least seems to be. The games aren't unfair per se, but they aren't generous either. You only have a few frames with which to dodge, parry timing must be perfect, and you can't cancel moves halfway through. You don't keep your souls or blood echoes upon death, and they are necessary to level up. If you farm them for a while, die, and then die again before you can reach the spot where you lost them, all that hard work is gone forever. These games don't give you an easy tutorial and experience, they give you a challenge. For example, Dark Souls 3 was my first Soulsborne game. When I first fought Aedex Gundyr, the tutorial boss, I really struggled. He felt fast and complicated, and I nearly gave up after dying half a dozen times. Now, I can beat him easily, and I doubt I would have gotten there if the game had held my hand through that first portion. There is nothing wrong with the game forgiving its players' mistakes, but Soulsborne games cement that this is not a necessary component to success. If you were like me and played The Division solo, you know that for much of its history, the game was straight up unfair. Enemies did more damage, had way more health, got some of, if not all, the tech you had by the end game, and were never alone. They could clean you out in seconds if you weren't in cover, and sometimes even if you were. The odds were stacked against you. You needed the best possible gear to beat the hardest challenges, but only got the best gear from beating the hardest challenges, which is a chicken-egg loop that results in a lot of deaths chasing a special torso armor you barely needed. PvP was incredibly unfair too. The Dark Zone was like the Wild West, with four-man kill squads just roaming and one-shotting people. Time to kill was incredibly low, and your gear didn't scale. Some of you are probably asking why I even bothered to play when the game was so stacked against me. I wasn't being offered a fair chance, so why should I play? Now this could be unique to me, but whenever I overcame the nigh-impossible challenge and mastered a mission so I could redo it at max difficulty to farm that really good gear item, I felt amazing. There is something so liberating and wonderful to knowing that you beat the odds. Do I think all games should be unfair? Absolutely not, but I don't think they should all be perfect either. Pathologic is pretty miserable. If you want an explanation of why the game is great, again, check out H Bomber Guy, because I'm just going to complain about it here. It's buggy. Its survival mechanics aren't survival mechanics in so much as they are murder bars, and the story can get convoluted. Depending on your edition, the translation from Russian is a pain and the voice acting is bad. It's not fun. At many moments you get frustrated, and yet it's still excellent. The game isn't about having fun necessarily, but that doesn't mean it's bad or not worth playing. On the contrary, suffering through hours of it is strangely wonderful. I would need to replay the game more and spend a whole video on it just to try and communicate why I like it, but there are plenty of good videos about it, again, H-bomb. So I just want us to realize that not every game is about having fun. Most should be, but some shouldn't. Because they actively tell stories, games can be the most diverse narrative art and deserve options that encompass every emotional variable, not just the standard. Part 7 the essentiality of subjectivity. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much. And if you understood anything I said, thank you even more, frankly. This part is going to be a lot shorter because I just want to address two ideas. First, I said earlier the games have to be fictional, and this is an opinion stated as fact. See, I personally do not see how you could ever create a game that was 100% true to real life events and their details. I worry that an attempt to do so while remaining active in storytelling, meaning keeping player choice, would have to include some options that did not happen. It is incredibly hard to be wholly accurate in nonfiction writing, since even a hint of personal bias can artificially recolor and shift the reality of events. And offering someone a choice where they can choose an action that did not occur would immediately move the game into the realm of historical fiction. Now, I would love to be proven wrong, so if any of you have a way around this problem, Get cracking designing games. I look forward to playing them. I also do not believe that this line of logic should be used to discourage games as education, since we can use metaphorization to still communicate essential information. 
Kingdom Come Deliverance, a game I love and hope to one day do a video about, is a historical fiction of life in medieval Europe and is still semi-accurate. Just because Henry was never real doesn't mean that playing through his life can't teach me anything about that era. Second, I have made a lot of claims in this video, all loosely strung together by a theory of passive versus active storytelling that I came up with myself. My views on the concept, the games listed, the mechanics, etc. are my own, and if I call one thing good or bad, it is a reflection of my subjective views. It's essential that you have your own, not just because I don't want brainwashed viewers, but because active storytelling is a unique experience. We will likely never play a game the same way, and so our views will always be different. Even passive storytelling is the same. When we read the exact same story, our life experiences will shape our perceptions of the novel and we can never really claim to have understood it identically. So if you disagree with something in this video, let me know. My views are malleable just like I hope yours are, and we should always be willing to consider other opinions, even if we end up disagreeing. Part 8. The End is Scripted As the end of the video, I wanted to talk about what I consider to be the largest hang-up some people might have with the video's main active concept. Games have pre-programmed endings. Even wave-based games like Call of Duty Zombies or Endless Runners come to a conclusion. The games all end and the ends are pre-programmed in, so what does it matter if we play or not? Isn't the consumer just as passive? I don't think so, because we never get to that credit screen if we don't keep engaging. A TV show will play through without us, but no game starts or functions without player input. If I boot up Dark Souls 3 and then leave for lunch, my character won't move, but my audiobook will be halfway done. Even a physical book we read doesn't change based on where we are, but games do, even if it is just to guide us to an endpoint. Think back to either of the fallouts discussed. There were multiple endings, and the player's story depended on how they played. Simply put, the experience becomes unique through the process of playing. And even if we reach the same endpoint, you and I will have taken different routes to get there. In this way, even games with just one ending are never truly the same experience for each player. If a game had no scripted endings, it wouldn't function. Even an endless runner makes you eventually trip. Sticking with the example of an endless runner for a moment, we have to realize that there was another story of that run where we tripped on a cone instead of a rock. In Fallout New Vegas, there's a version where I side with the Legion, or with Mr. House, as opposed to the NCR or Yes Man. These endings are just as real, even though I never reach them. They are all possibilities that someone will have, and that I could even experience on a subsequent playthrough. Games are active stories because they can be changed through choice. Some games may only have one ending, but the path players take to reach it will always be slightly different, and that makes the story unique. Think of speedruns for Mario games. As far as I know, those games only have one ending, but people continue to attempt the runs over and over and over again, shaving milliseconds off of their time. To the speedrunner community, these small changes have huge effects, and the same idea is the separation between passive and active storytelling. Even if my choices only make my playthrough slightly different than yours, we both shaped our stories actively, instead of just consuming them passively. Think back to the very beginning of this video, to books. At first glance, books might seem active. Unlike a film, a book can't watch, or rather read, itself. However, we are overlooking how one reads if we assume that the book is active. Our eyes are dragged to the next sentence, whereas games let us make a choice of how to proceed. Once you begin reading a page, your eyes are drawn to the next word, and choosing to turn a page is not a choice akin to whether you fight dancer before or after fort, but rather akin to deciding to turn off your console or not. Just because books require some engagement does not mean that we alter their stories or control them in any way. Again, there is nothing wrong with passive storytelling, and right now, games don't even necessarily reach perfect active storytelling, since their code can only allow players to do so much. Hopefully this video reaches someone and helps them understand the overlooked potential in video games and other active methods. The option to shape the story directly rather than consume. The luxury of world building level being tailored to player's liking. The characterization not through language but through behavior. And the changing of 
present expectations are all ideas that I hope we begin to explore critically and use more consciously. Well, that's honestly all I have. I really hope some part of this video connected with you as a viewer because I poured a lot of time and maybe even a bit of me into the script. If this provoked any thoughts, please share them in the comments. I think I'll be able to respond to them all since this channel, at least at the time of upload, has no subscribers, so I look forward to conversing with anyone who stumbles across this video. I want to continue to make videos like this, explaining how storytelling shifts and changes through mediums and individual works, so if you have an interest in that, please subscribe. My next video is likely going to be on Mexican-American border literature, so I get to really break out my English major credentials. It probably won't be this long, but I hope it will capture your attention as well. Thanks ever so much for watching. Subscribe and check my socials in the description, please. Uh, I'm Huey, and this is my channel Delta. If you're wondering about the name, I'll maybe make a video on it someday. Cheers.